Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Isby. Thank you very much for coming and thank you for your uh, evidence. Um, is there anything you would like to say by way of introduction before we set off on the questioning? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the opportunity to inform your uh, deliberations. Uh, I think I'd start by saying I'm not entirely sure why you, know, you need to be existing in a sense that I certainly don't think there should be any dilution of the Freedom of Information Act, which uh, you are looking at. Uh, I think if you were looking to strengthen it and extend it, uh, which I hope perhaps you might, I don't know whether your um, remit allows you to do that, I hope you will consider uh, some ways in which it could be extended and strengthened. Uh, but the Act itself, I think, remains probably one of the most important things that uh, the government of which Mr. Straw was a member ever did. Uh, and I, as I wrote in the Times this morning, it was one of those pieces of legislation, a, a landmark piece of legislation that I thought was irreversible, something that no government would ever think of trying to go back on. Uh, my starting point is that anything that uh, a public body does with taxpayers' money, uh, the taxpayers pushing the bills ought to know what is being done with their money uh, and the ability to ask those questions of authorities spending their money is, is absolutely vital. And obviously there are exemptions relating to national security and you know, individual, private individuals' health and welfare issues, of course, and that's right. But, but in the main, there should be a presumption of if taxpayers' money is paying for something, we have a right as taxpayers to know what is being done with our money in our name. And I celebrate the fact that uh, we've had a Freedom of Information Act in this country uh, for the last 16 years, and I said I'd like to see it strengthened and certainly not diluted. Um, Mr. Be, you'll have to forgive me for not having yet read the Times this morning. I will read your article with interest later. Um, in your evidence, the Taxpayers' Alliance seems to be saying that the protections provided in Section 35 and 36 are sufficient. Um, is that a covert way of saying that the protections in Section 35 and 36 are excessive because if so, would you say so and tell us uh, why you think they are excessive? I think we're saying that uh, at the moment they, they work pretty well and that there is no obvious call uh, for them to, to, to be um, strengthened. But uh, at the same time, I'm not sure anyone's necessarily saying they, they need to be particularly changed either. Uh, and this is what strikes me about this whole uh, commission, that... You know, the, the Act is working very well at the moment, and I think um, you know, there, there's a, a kind of desire to, you know, this is a solution in search of a problem almost. Well, you have to bear in mind that it was not the Commission that formed the Commission. I, are you saying that there is no legitimacy in having a debate as to whether the Act is working well and whether it should be reduced in its effect or expanded in its oh, effect? I think a debate is very important and as I say I think there are ways we can look at how you can extend uh, and strengthen the, the Act uh, in, in terms of the, the remit and, and who it covers and perhaps we'll talk about that in a minute uh, and you know, I, I certainly don't blame you as someone invited to take part in this uh, for, for the fact that you know, you've been asked to look at some things which, which you know, I, I think the, the, the government is privately already having second thoughts about it, frankly. Well, I mean, we're not the government, so now we've established that there is some validity in the debate. Um, can we move on to something else? In your evidence, the Taxpayers' Alliance appears to suggest that different public uh, bodies interpret the public interest differently. Um, does that matter? I think that does matter in that, you know... I mean, the Taxpayers' Alliance will often ask the same question of every single council across the whole UK, for example. You know, how, how much did you spend on international travel last year, for example? And, you know, the fact that different councils will come up with, uh, well, some will say it's in the public interest or not, or some will say that it, we can afford to, you know, that... that um, to, to answer this would be will cost too much, and others say, and others will just hand the answer within hours of coming. You know, shows that some councils are working very efficiently in the way that they process data and being open in the culture in the way that they hand that data to uh, people who made a request. 
and that others are not raises an important issue and I think you know, best practice needs to be occurring and you know, the councils that are less open and you know, less efficient in how they respond need to be looking I, I, at other me, ones. I don't think anybody would dispute that there should be consistency if the same question is being asked <coughs> of councils uh, seeking information on the same issue. Do you accept, however, that taking the issue of public interest in a more abstract sense, public interest may look quite different to, for example, a body considering national security as opposed to a body con which is providing information on, say, trading standards prosecutions. Would you like, therefore, to produce a definition of the public interest, or are you content that bodies should look at public interest within the context of their own work? I accept there is clearly a, a big difference between national security issues and the trade issues or, or, or other things that, that, that you might have just mentioned. Um, I still think the, the presumption needs to be that you know, pretty much everything that a public body does is in the public interest for that to be in the open, apart from the, the very small number of areas where say, national security is concerned or private individuals' health or welfare records are involved. Um, no, the, the, the presumption always needs to be that, no, on, on, in favour of publication. I don't think anybody would dispute that, but could try, can I try and focus you on the abstract question of the public interest? Um, would you seek, would your Taxpayers Alliance, which does a very valuable public job, seek to define the public interest more exactly, or are you content for the public interest to be a much broader concept, rather like, say, the British Constitution, which at the moment is not written down? Of, of which many of you are a part. Um, I think, I, I, it, again, I, I suppose it, at the end of the day, it would depend on, on how that was defined. I, you know, I'm, I'm nervous about going down a route where there's a, a very specific definition which potentially might allow information that is currently published to not be published. Um, so, you know, whether there's a way in which it, it can be defined you know, broadly enough so as to not have any impact on, on publication, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, you support proactive uh, publication of information on cabinet discussions and agreements. Given that the cabinet is not a public forum, at what stage is it your view that information on cabinet discussions and agreements should be published? Well, I think we said in our submission that you know, we're moving from a 30-year rule towards a 20-year rule, and I, I think that's a sensible and reasonable uh, move forward. Um, I think you know, any possibility of, of proactive publication uh, you know, before 20 years w would be a good thing. Can, can we avoid the word proactive? Because with respect, I don't think it means very much in this context. Can you be more exact and say, are you, tell us, for example, whether you're saying that um, minutes of cabinet discussions should be published immediately after the discussion has taken place or do you accept that there is a, a policy making space in which the cabinet should be able to discuss <coughs> including the sometimes unthinkable to be sure that there has been some real blue sky thinking at cabinet level before uh, people can say oh the cabinet has been thinking outrageous things I think it's fair for that policy space to exist, and I'm certainly not demanding immediate publication of minutes. I think in terms of a cabinet wanting to you know, help persuade the public of the merit of the course of action it's taking uh, may actually uh, you know, benefit in trying to persuade the public by being open about uh, the, the discussion that's had and, and how they've come to the conclusions they've come to. And I think if ministers wanted to, uh, of their own volition, uh, on particular issues put that out there that would be a good thing although dare I say it um, and again those of you on the panel who've served in cabinets uh, know full well that uh, it's often the, the next day's media which gets a very early uh, report of what has happened uh, at cabinet meetings so um, ministers themselves when it suits them are, are keen to, to get that information uh, out there through one channel or another. Um, I've never leaked cabinet minutes, possibly only because I've never been in a cabinet, um, Mr. Isabee. But what 
kind of material do you think could and should be published? I mean, one of the um, issues we touched on in our evidence was uh, the, the current debate about HS2 and how, you know, potentially tens of billions of pounds of taxpayers' money is going to be spent on a scheme which, uh, well, we believe the business case simply doesn't stack up and there needs to be more openness about the, uh, the, the way that conclusions have been made uh, to spend huge amounts of taxpayers' money uh, on the back of, we think, a very flimsy case. Uh, and there was discussion about you know, risk assessments, whether they should be uh, subject to, to FOI. And you no, know, absolutely, they should be. If politicians are going to go down a course where a risk assessment has said, you know, there are quite big risks here, uh, we think the pro public probably have a right to know that. The, the politicians you know, are absolutely at will uh, and free to defend the decisions they've made, uh, but they need to be held accountable for those decisions. And what I stage should ri risk assessments be exposed? Because you may agree, whatever your view of HS2 and mine, that risk assessments sometimes need a degree of risk assessment themselves. There may well be a dispute about competing risk assessments, which maybe a cabinet might want to resolve before it publishes risk assessments if it does. So you're saying that risk assessments should be published at every stage? I, I think the, in, in, in general, yes. So, I mean, again, it, it comes down to a, a presumption of, you know, unless there is a very, very convincing good case not to, then, then why on earth not? In but that may be a matter of opinion. I mean, there are varied opinions, aren't there, on HS2? If you were well, to ask the major cities in the north their view of HS2, th th they would not necessarily agree with the Taxpayers' Alliance. At what stage, therefore, do you think it's legitimate for this kind of uh, risk analysis to be published? Well, I say sooner rather than later. I, I, it, it's, you know, we're, we're talking in very hypothetical terms um, about risk assessments of risk assessments, uh, which sounds almost like something out of Yes Minister, really. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I can't give you a, a precise answer of, as to what should happen in, in that hypothetical situa situation. Suffice to say, you know, I think moving towards more publication is, is the right direction of travel. Sounds like you're favoring more publication on the basis of a judgment made in the public interest. Is that a fair conclusion from what you said. Yes, I think you Thank you, that's very, very, very helpful. Um, the, the evidence of your organization states that public bodies invite burdens on themselves by not answering requests on time and or in sufficient detail. What would your proposals be for addressing that undoubted problem? Well, I think you know, there needs to be uh, needs to be told to public bodies in no uncertain terms what their responsibilities are under the law, uh, that they have to answer requests within a certain period of time. And I, I don't think enough of them take that seriously enough at the moment. Um, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I'm hesitant to go down the road of kind of financial sanctions because obviously that starts involving you know, taxpayers' money at, at stake. But in order for the, the message to get home, I think it needs to be no, made absolutely clear from the highest level to, to tell those bodies that you, know, you have obligations under law and, and you should absolutely carry them out, of course. You, you, you'll be aware that we've had many representations from public bodies saying that the Freedom of Information Act um, regime is unduly burdensome on them, that it's uh, too costly, and that the uh, fee rates which are taken as the standard hourly rate are simply unrealistic. Um, at 2015 realities. Um, do you think that's an important point or do you think it's a, a point which actually, uh, which is made but conceals that the real overall cost of answering requests is quite small? I think, it's a, red, I think it's a red herring because, you know, the overall cost of answering co uh, requests is far smaller than the budgets that <coughs> public bodies have for self-promotion and, and their own information management about what they want to put out there. This is about what the public want to know who make the request. And a lot of this comes down to the following, that actually if a lot of this information were published routinely, 
you wouldn't actually even need to have an FOI procedure in place to get the information in the first place. No, the nature of technology these days and the internet and so on and so forth is such that huge amounts of information could be published very, very cheaply and instantly, uh, completely cutting out the need for the process to even happen in the first place. So I think there should be far more automatic publication uh, of information so that you wouldn't even need to go through the process. Well, what about the point that is made that sometimes FOI is simply used by, um, forgive me using the term with at least one journalist in the room, idle journalists, when they can perfectly well find the information on open sources anyway? Well, if it's available on open sources, the, the, the reply will come back very quickly. Here's the link of where you find the information. So you and I dare say, and the same thing happens with parliamentary questions, that, you know, you, you will ask a parliamentary question and if the information is already there, you know, you'll be appointed so to So you, you think it's acceptable for a, a public authority to be robust in those circumstances and say, this is not a proper FOI request, it's all available on open sources anyway? If, if the information is already there, then, then absolutely. If, if, if it's, it's reasonable to say, here's the information, here's the link, we've already put it online, a a absolutely. But in terms of the cost element of it, is it's, go back to my point before, that I think there's deep inefficiencies in some public bodies uh, by the fact that some will answer requests from us very quickly within hours, giving us what we have asked for, whereas others will prevaricate and email back and forth sure. for weeks, even months, uh, before giving what ought to be a pretty simple answer to a simple question. Could I, could, could I just go back to the, the answer you gave uh, a couple of uh, questions ago, Mr. Wissaby, where you said that... Uh, public authorities ought to be more active in making information available. I'm, I think we're all very sympathetic to that. Um, are there particular categories of information? Uh, I mean, for example, you, you mentioned one which is overseas flights by public officials, but others in that, well, well, what, what categories of information that you're seeking do you think should just be routinely made available yeah. as part of the publication plan of the, uh, local of the public authority. And can I just add to that? I was going to ask you in particular something about something that your organization has produced masses of inf interesting information about, which is the expenses and benefits in kind uh, and, uh, of senior executives. I mean, do you think, following up um, Jack Straw's question, that that sort of information should be published proactively yeah, I mean, well, I mean, a lot of that is now anyway, yeah. certainly as far as kind of government ministers and you know, senior civil servants in Whitehall are, are concerned, that is now in the public domain. And I think, you know, a lot of that has come about because of the pressure that the mm. Taxpayers Alliance and others put on mm. from our founding back in 2004 for more transparency about where taxpayers' money uh, is going. Uh, and that, so that culture of openness is, is starting to, to be there as a, as a, as a permanent thing, which, which, which is a good thing. But... You know, clearly there is more to be done. Are there in categories of things that you would like to see openly published in I that mean, look, way? I mean, look, no, no, council expenditure. I mean, yeah. so the Taxpayers' Alliance is, is mainly concerned about money and spending lines within budgets. Uh, and that is exactly the kind of stuff that absolutely should, should be there, you know, as a matter of course, for people to see, uh, you know, broken down, no, pretty down to a pretty low level as to how much has been spent on each individual line of budget, uh, and you know, the, the, on, on, as far as that goes, the, the more information, the better. As far as I'm concerned, I, I think all uh, local authorities have to publish uh, details of spending above 500 pounds now. Mm. So has that made a difference? It has made a difference, although different bodies will publish the information and in. in more accessible ways than others, and I think certainly uh, a move towards you know, more, uh, I mean, obviously, look, you know, sharing best practice and looking towards what is the most beneficial and productive way of publishing it, uh, so that, certainly so that you can compare and contrast, because you know, a lot of what we do is about trying to identify you know, which bodies are delivering best value, which are not delivering so good value, so that you can compare and contrast and say, well, look, if X council is delivering this service for that amount of money, you know, why can't you down the road do the same sure. thing and, 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 and hopefully, therefore, push overall costs down? To the can I turn now to a different subject? 
Um, the Taxpayers' Alliance has said that it supports FOI by covering <coughs> private companies delivering public services under contracts. Does that extend to charities too, delivering public services under contracts? Yes, I think it would. And, and we look at, I mean, obviously Kids Company has been in the news over the last few months, a body that was handed I think in excess of £40 million over a decade uh, with absolutely no accountability to the taxpayers footing the bill as to how that money was being spent. Would, uh, you, would you have a, a, a lower limit on the burden that that would push upon small companies and charities? I mean, one can, I can give you two examples to focus on. One might be a, a, comp a small company possibly doing some painting and decorating on a pavilion on playing fields belonging to a council. Um, another example might be a small mental health charity which is receiving a small number of tens of thousands from a local authority or from a health commissioner to provide services. Are you suggesting that small organizations like that should be subject to what they would say would be a disproportionately expensive burden or would you be prepared to set a lower limit and if so what? I'm no, I'm not going to pluck a figure out the air as to what that lower limit should be. I think, I think there is, I, clearly, you need to look at what proportion of that organization's budget is coming from the taxpayer to decide what would be a reasonable uh, demand to make of them. I think, you know, as far as possible, it would come back to, you know, on the charity or private sector company's part of publishing you know, very solid and detailed accounts of where, how they have spent that money, that particular chunk of money which has come, uh, taxpayers' money that's come from government or Quango or public body or whatever, uh, in order that the information is out there so that there would be you know, relatively few questions that could be asked of it. Why, uh, why should that be the responsibility of the service provider as opposed to the commissioner? Why cannot the commissioning authority be responsible for publishing the information about the commissionee's activities? Well, the commissionee would presumably have to provide the information to the commissioning body in Why? the first place. Well, surely, if a council uh, commissions a charity to provide mental health services, the mm. commissioner will know exactly how much money it's paying to that charity. Yes, no, it'll know how much it's paying to that charity, but in terms of digging a bit deeper down the budget lines as to how much has been spent on, you know, within that chunk of money that they've been given in order to establish, uh, you, know, what, you know, where the money has gone, uh, you know, that, that would clearly be something that the, the commissionee would have to provide. Why do we need this when the accounts of companies and indeed the accounts of charities, which were the most part of companies, need to have to be published by law anyway? And if you read the accounts which you can get on the internet, you will obtain the information you require. I don't think that the accounts, for example, of kids' company, I'm, 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 you know, I've kind of singled them out because they've been in the news, but I don't think had we been looking at the accounts of kids' company that as published would have answered the searching questions that have now been asked of them as to what happened to that £40 million. Hmm. But let's just put kids' company aside because hard cases can make bad law. If one takes a more standard, let's suppose there are some honest charities and honest companies around that are not criticized or questioned. Is it fair to those companies to place yet another regulatory requirement on them when the information may well be available by open source means anyway? Well, I'm not sure that the, the detailed information that we think ought to be in the public domain would be available through, through open source automatically. Um, and again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm loath to, to, to heap you know, particular, particular burdens onto businesses, not least because successive governments have, have heaped all kinds of burdens onto them ov over the years. And you know, I'm instinctively a fan of deregulation. Um, but if a company or charity is a beneficiary of taxpayers' money, then I think that adds a certain onus on them to, to account for where it's gone. Yes, thank you. Um, you, um, you, you seem to agree that vect vexatious and over-costly requests should be dealt with by existing exemptions. Hmm. 
Some of the evidence we have is that public authorities are reluctant to use those exemptions. Is it your view that better gu operational guidance is needed to public authorities so that they know the circumstances in which they will be forgiven for using those um, exemptions? I, you know, maybe some, some extra operational guidance could be helpful. Uh, but again, this comes down to the fact that we think that the Section 14 rules, you know, work pretty well at the moment. And, you know, I'm not... Have you read the evidence that you've had on this from some of the public authorities? Because a significant number of them say that they find this a very difficult thing to operate. That it, it despite recent judgments about it, that it remains a, a troublesome area as far as they're concerned. You know, and look, the, you know, the situation is never going to be perfect. But I think um, we... Yeah, you said that sufficient exemptions are placed in... Uh, I understand that. But if the people concerned find it difficult to operate, then that suggests that uh, there may still be a problem with the way in which it's been defined. I, I haven't read all the evidence from all the public authorities that have, have submitted to you because that would take yeah. a very long time. <laughs> but, um, I know. But at the end of the day, there are some authorities, you know, which, as far as I'm concerned, seem happy with the rules as they are. And I think, you know, the, 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 the guys who are dealing with it happily, you know, perhaps need to be liaising with people who are struggling with it to, to work out what could be done better and to, to share best practice. Um, and say, if that, if that does require some, some new operational guidance to, 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 to bring together how the rules should be working, then, then, then so be it. Okay, I think, uh, thank you very much. Is there anything that you would like to say that we haven't covered? Um, um, because our I, time is I, up, I'm I afraid. Don't think so. I we think have that, a lot to get through today. Pretty much covers uh, everything. I'm aware I'm the warm up app for some far more distinguished. No, no, no. no. <laughs> up nicely. Not at all. But, uh, Not thank, at all. You, thank you very much for having no, us. Well, thank you very much for your evidence and thank you very much for coming. It's thank been very helpful. Pleasure. Good uh, Thank you very much uh, for your evidence and thank you very much for, for coming uh, this morning. Thanks for uh, inviting us. Is there anything you would like to say by way of an opening statement? Just a few brief words, if I might. It's Liberty's view that the evidence on the Freedom of Information Act is clear, it's working, and it's working well. It's more or less done what, it, and it's doing what it's set out to do, and that's achieve a greater openness in government, a measure of public accountability, a crucial tool in providing citizens, given that it's, they're the largest group of people who actually use the Act on a day-to-day -day basis at both central and local government level. Um, and it also saves an enormous amount of public money for what is ultimately quite a small budgetary expenditure. Uh, the, whether it's MPs expenses or local council ex expenditure on luxury cars and a vast number of other um, issues of public expense that have been revealed. It's, it's clear that the Act is providing it, what it basically was mm. tasked with doing. Um, but I think something that Liberty can speak to more particularly is its impact on access to justice. We at Liberty take on cases and intervene in existing ones um, on issues of significance and public importance such as the discriminatory effect of police stop and search powers and it's in cases like that um, and uh, along with many other people, and citizen, the ordinary citizen uses the Freedom of Information Act in their own cases, um, that enable us and others to get key information necessary for bringing a claim, investigating aspects of it that we can't get through um, litigation later, um, and to supplement the, the process of litigation um, to vindicate people's rights and uh, challenge decisions of authorities where they've done wrong. Uh, and so I think in, a, in an area of 
real public importance and in an era of quite significant retrenchment in access to justice through changes to legal aid, um, any further attempts to impose fees, widen exemptions and so forth would represent an even more uh, retrograde step uh, in, in providing access to justice. And I'll just close by saying that the Justice Committee went through the evidence in 2012 pretty, uh, pr pretty thoroughly and came to conclusions that, in our view, haven't been displaced. The evidence is still clear. The Supreme Court decision in Evans uh, clarified, the, clarified the position in some respects, but is completely consistent with the use of the veto hitherto, and we expect going forward as well. So in our view, the, and I th we think the evidence shows that the Act is working well and changes, changes to widen exemptions or anything else should not be made. Thank you. Um, you uh, uh, introduce the full range of the Freedom of Information Act. Um, uh, as you said, uh, the information that gives citizens um, what they need to know in terms of wide range of government services, police, health and so on, you make a very important point about access to justice. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't think that there would be a great deal of um, uh, disagreement with you on that. But can I um, narrow down um, the area of discussion to the safe space for um, policy deliberations? In your evidence, you argue that there is no basis for creating protections already available to public bodies and ministers that's in sections 35 and 36 in the power of the veto that you just referred to under section 53. Can you expand a little on your reasoning in that particular area? Well, in our view, it's clear from the evidence available that section 35 and, um, and also section 36 act as completely adequate safeguards in protecting what are legitimate government and public interests, um, which you've just described. And it's clear that the tribunal, along with the information commissioner, are continuing to interpret what it means for disclosure to be and to not be in the public interest. Um, but case after, in case after case, the tribunal has found, uh, has, has decided um, where the public interest lies. And we believe that it's the job of the tribunal to continue doing so. And the evidence shows that it's done so correctly. The, the, the supposed chilling effect that is, that's alleged by government ministers in evidence after evidence of bodies such as UCL's Constitution Unit, many others that gave evidence to the Justice Committee, the, the evidence is weak on that. Uh, there's, there's just as much evidence, if not more, of an improvement effect that you might describe. The, the openness that the Act requires is just the sort of thing that's going to focus policymakers' minds on improving their internal records and improving the level of and quality of deliberation that they go through as they reach uh, decisions of public weight. So can I just be clear, you're not challenging the legitimacy of the idea of a safe space? We, I think everyone recognizes that uh, there, are, there are legitimate public interests to be protected, um, but the, just the level of disagreement is often at the definition of what a safe space Involves Indeed. An, an entirely protected space that uh, admits of no openness or transparency is plainly not something that the public would accept and which the regime that's been instituted rightly um, allows. Now, a retrenchment on that just simply wouldn't be justified in our view. We heard from the uh, Freedom of Information Commissioner last week that both he and um, departments had become more adept over time at understanding what sections 35 and 36 might mean and that he had revised guidance. Um, would you consider that that might mean that it's not as clear as it might be? It's, as with all decisions in law and in policy making where the, 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 the public interest needs to be safeguarded, it's going to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Clear and totally bright line rules are just not going to be possible. And of course, as other people have said during evidence here, uh, you could have clarity by simply exempting absolutely everything. And that's not the level of clarity that anyone I think wants and recognizes as legitimate. You're going to have a case-by-case -case assessment of what's in the public interest. Um, and that's just the sort of thing that the information commissioner and the tribunal are tasked with doing and have shown to be able to do 
uh, adequately. In your evidence, you say nothing has changed uh, that justifies a departure from the conclusions of the Justice Select Committee. Do you think the Supreme Court ruling on the veto changes the operation of the Act in any way? We don't think the evidence shows this. Um, we think the use of the veto hitherto has been very spare. It's only been used, I believe, seven or eight times, depending on how you define it, technically or otherwise. It's, uh, and and that's, that's, the, that's the government's guidance on the matter. The guidance that the coalition government uh, released in 2011 made clear that it has to be used very sparingly. Um, and I think that's the way it was also presented as the bill was passed in Parliament. Uh, there's, there, there, was, there was very little suggestion, if not, there may have, uh, no suggestion, in fact, that it was going to be used routinely or at all against tribunals. Um, rather, it was presented as a counter, counterbalance to the, decision, to the decision to make the Information Commission's decisions binding. Um, now, and, and in fact, the appeal system that was instituted was actually presented as the bill was passed as a, as a as parallel uh, protection for government decision making with the veto. Uh, so in our view, um, that's all consistent um, with the, the, the Supreme Court's decision in Evans, uh, which found that the circumstances in which a veto can be used are very slim. Um, and uh, given that there is just something uh, constitutionally dubious about the use of a veto against a properly reasoned decision of a tribunal. Um, and, and, and also, it's, not, it's, it's, it's important not to forget the circumstances of that case, um, which are very fact-specific. Fact um, a very well-reasoned decision of the tribunal was vetoed um, in a manner which didn't engage, um, which both majorities of the decision found, with the, the, the reasons provided. Um, so in our view, there shouldn't be anything really surprising um, in the Supreme Court's decision. And that's why the Justice Committee's findings on that uh, uh, just simply aren't dislodged. We, we do have evidence from other quarters suggesting that the, um, the judgment has created uncertainty about the use of the veto. And the judgment itself emphasized that some aspects of the legislation were not crystal clear. Um, I mean, there's always going to be areas of any provision that have aspects of unclarity. Um, and that's, that, I mean, that's just the nature of legislation is that it can't provide for all contingencies in all circumstances. Uh, before the fact. And again, that's also why we have an independent judiciary tasked with interpreting them in light of ongoing uh, facts and updated principles. Um, so again, it's our view that the way in which you resolve those aspects of in clarity are through um, it, judicial interpretation uh, by our independent judiciary. And it's exactly what happened in Evans. Uh, and from what you said, you seem to agree with the Justice Select Committee that the ministerial veto is a necessary backstop to protect highly sensitive material. It's our view that, that the, as the evidence stands, there's no, we, we, we oppose changes to be, for it to be made um, wider and for it to be, for, for, for there to be wider exemptions as well to supplement any veto. Uh, we don't think that the evidence has changed to dislodge the, the, the committee's finding, even though we may find the notion of a veto constitutionally troubling. Thank you. Um, uh, now, you do seem to accept, and you say it's um, inherent in legislation anyway, that there's considerable uncertainty about the operation of sections 35 and 36 and the interaction with the public interest test. Um, you, and, and you've just repeated that where it's not clear, um, uh, it's for the courts to decide. Um, could I just ask you again whether or not the drafting of these sections might not be a little clearer, um, and if they're not clear enough, this in itself could have a chilling effect. I think the evidence as it stands from people from whom you've heard evidence, such as the Information Commissioner and others, has been that the legislation broadly is clear enough. It's, it's working well. Um, there's a problem of a kind of selection bias insofar as the high-profile decisions are the, are the ones that reach senior officials are the ones about which a furore is generated. Uh, at the ground level of freedom of information, the sort of requests that people day-to-day -day use, ordinary citizens use against their local councils and from time to time central government, people know exactly what needs to be done, um, which exemptions can be used, which cannot. Um, 
there's always a danger, I think, uh, in, leg in, in attempting to legislate uh, in light of a very small number of very high profile cases where cabinet ministers may wish a little bit of, of information wasn't put into the public domain. I don't think there's any evidence to show that any retrenchment needs to be made on the basis of those cases. If, as uh, the Supreme Court found in the Evans case, the legislation is not crystal clear, isn't there a case for Parliament to look again at the legislation to ensure that it properly and clearly reflects the will of Parliament rather than relying, as you suggested, on judicial decisions? Well, I, d I, d I don't think those two things are incompatible. I mean, part of what it is to interpret legislation is, and as Evans did, look at the will of Parliament. There was a great deal of um, interpretative weight placed on exactly what Parliament intended. And as I said, the, 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 on, on the facts of the case, the, the veto, as Evans interpreted, was consistent with what um, was said during the passage of the bill and the way it's been interpreted henceforth. So I, I, Liberty doesn't think that there is this uh, disconnect between Parliament's intention behind the scheme of the Act, including the veto, and the way it's been interpreted hitherto. Well, the Supreme Court found that there was a disconnect because they thought that the legislation was not crystal clear. So if the legislation is not crystal clear, I'm sure it wasn't Parliament's intention to legislate in a way that wasn't clear, isn't there a case for Parliament looking at it again to ensure that clarity is achieved? Well, I'd say let's look at what the Justice Committee found in Parliament about the legislation um, at a time where any reasons for thinking the legislation wasn't crystal clear in my view would have applied just at that point and they said there's no, cha there's no case for making any change. But, but the Justice Committee was before uh, the Supreme Court decision and indeed the Justice Committee said that the veto was an important part if I remember of the, uh, of the Precisely. legislation. Precisely and, that's, and, and that's, why, that's why we say that the Supreme Court's decision isn't, consist isn't, isn't inconsistent with um, what was said by the Justice Committee. The veto remains. Um, its use will be sparing. There will be very, there, there is, as was recognized all through the last decade of the Act's implementation, uh, the veto can only be used in a small number of cases, very, very rarely. Uh, that's, why, that's why we say there's no real change since the Justice Committee's findings to displace them, including in relation to the veto. Earlier in your evidence, referring to the Evans case, you uh, describe, I think, the government's behaviour as constitutionally devious? No, dubious. Dubious. I, I didn't right. describe what, the government's behaviour Sorry, I misheard that. you. What is the dubiety you're referring to, bearing in mind that there is an issue here, which I'm sure Liberty would wish to address, about the separation of powers and what are the legitimate roles of ministers and the courts? Exactly. Uh, just for, for clarity, my description was in relation to the power of veto against properly and well-reasoned decisions of tribunals. That's quite a different proposition from a claim that the veto could never be used in any circumstances whatsoever on the basis of constitutional dubiety. But can what we take I claimed it? was that, and in line with the Supreme Court's decision, that a use of the veto against the tribunal, and in, a, a part of the independent judiciary with the same status in its judgments as, as the High Court, um, ha, is, is constitutionally dubious. And that's what, that's what the majority found. That's why the use of the veto uh, will have to be so rare um, in, its, in its view. Can we take it that subject to judicial review principles of courts, liberty would not wish to undermine the separation of powers so that neither judges take the place of ministers nor ministers use up the role of judges. Absolutely. Um, and the separation of powers cuts both ways. Um, on the one hand, par Parliament legislates and the judiciary interprets it. Um, it's on the, on the one... And on the, it's, you can, one, one important safeguard on the separation of powers is not allowing the executive to override decisions of that judiciary. Um, Ever? Well, it's, it's extremely, again, with, it's, mu it's much easier to focus on particular cases. And in this particular case, the ca the, 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 there was no, the, 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 constitution, the constitutionality of doing so was clearly bad. But you can't say never, can you? In our view, the, the separation of powers 
precludes an ability for, of the executive to simply override decisions of the judiciary. Ever. Okay. Even if Parliament makes the choice? No, that's not. That's that, that wouldn't, w Parliament remains uh, sovereign um, under our system, and that's a hugely important okay. constitutional principle. Simply through the interpretation of legislation, uh, the... But if Parliament had made it crystal clear that uh, it, uh, it had intended the veto to be used against uh, a judicial decision, you would still object to that? At, as, at, at the policy level, we think, we would think that that would be a, a dangerous step right. to take. Whether that would, the, the, in our system, that would still, plainly that would stand. The judiciary is unable to strike down legislation, but it would be important to interpret that legislation um, as consistently with fundamental rights as possible. And exact, that's exactly the principle that the court in Evans used. Um, Mr. Hawke, um, you're obviously very familiar with the Supreme Court's decision in Evans. Do you accept, leave aside the, the, the merits of the decision, that the effect of the decision was unquestionably and admitted by the majority Supreme Court justices to restrict the circumstances in which the veto could be exercised, where it was exercised over uh, a decision which had been appealed? In our view, the evidence over the last 10 years is pretty clear. The use of the veto is very rare. Well, um, that, 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 that's, that's a matter of fact, um, but is it not also the case, and it's brought out by Lord Wilson when he said in terms that the decision of the majority was, quotes, to rewrite the Act, that the consequence of the Supreme Court's decision was to narrow very significantly the grounds on which the veto could be used where this was seeking to override a decision of a court or tribunal. If it's the case that it was, it was understood that the veto could be used for that purpose, uh, perhaps. But again, we don't say that that was what was understood by the use of the veto in general terms. There's very little evidence to show that that was what was contemplated in Parliament as the bill was passed. It was, count it was a counterpart to the, U to the Information Commissioner's ability to make binding decisions. If it had been said, this is a veto against the use of the, the decisions of the tribunal, the matter might be different. But it wasn't. It was, uh, it was, it was what I, I previously said. Now, in those circumstances, I think it's very difficult to say that the Supreme Court's decision significantly or at all really narrowed the circumstances in which people generally and um, legitimately believed the uh, circumstances of the veto could, uh, w were available. That, I, think that, I think the legislative history in the passage of the bill shows that. Okay. Um, uh, we'll move on to uh, another aspect uh, of the Act. Um, do you consider that it imposes a burden on public authorities? I, I think discussion of burden is inappropriate. I think this is just simply what a government pays for in may, remaining open, remaining transparent, and remaining accountable. It's, uh, it's basically a cost of running a decent government, uh, and it's a very, very small cost in overall terms. Uh, a constant refrain is the fact, as, as many people have said, it's five times less expensive than running the government's public relations service, um, which I think is a serious, um, uh, that, that suggests something about uh, the more we could be doing to make freedom of information uh, better in this country. Um, but, so, so I think in those terms, it's the use, yeah, the use of the word burden, I don't think is appropriate. Um, and I think there's sufficient safeguards in the Act already to uh, stop cost, overly costly and vexatious requests. We already have um, Section 14 that's, again, been interpreted in a way uh, beneficial to local authorities and the government uh, to stop disproportionately costly uh, requests. Um, I, I, I think that's a, and that, that provision is a targeted way of cutting costs. Uh, where, where it's appropriate. Introducing fees, for example, would be an extremely blunt instrument. I think that's what the case of Ireland demonstrates, where 50% of requests under the Act were reduced after its introduction of fees, um, and then later they were removed because, for very good reason, they were deemed inappropriate. The, introducing fees just has no way of selecting between what the government believes are meritorious requests and which are not. Um, a, a provision like Section 14 enables you to select between 
few requests that are too costly, vexatious, and normal requests that should be uh, facilitated under the Act. Uh, so you would argue that Section 14 is, is clear enough. What, why do you think public authorities are reluctant to use it? Uh, I think public authorities would, would sometimes... Um, uh, well, I, th I think on the one hand, I think we, as, as the previous um, person who gave evidence stated, there are public authorities who don't feel that there's a problem with Section 14 um, and who feel that they're able to use it uh, properly. So I'm not sure the preponderance of evidence uh, goes in favour of, of a view at all that Section 14 is unclear, um, and, uh, well, and especially in light of recent tribunal decision-making that has um, uh, interpreted the provision favourably to those who want to get uh, to block off disproportionate requests. Um, so, so, yeah. So, do you think the details of the um, application of the framework for requests and how they are, um, when and how they have to be delivered, is appropriate in the current? I mean, as we said in our written evidence, Liberty has um, difficulties with the Act in the overbroadness, in our view, of exemption categories, the use of class exemptions where specific exemptions should be deployed, or the lack, of the, the use of, say, a prejudice test rather than something of greater harm. Um, and there are other there are other difficulties that could be highlighted, um, including the, the uh, delays in uh, facilitating requests by local by public authorities, but. Again, we think that the evidence, of the evidence and the findings of the Justice Committee are clear. There's just no case for changing the Act um, at this stage. Thank you, Mr. Hawke. Okay. Mr. Hawke, thank you very much. Is there anything you want to say by, or was that your, that was, sense? sounded like a closing remark to me. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Good morning, Mr. Simmons. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your uh, evidence. Um, is there anything that you would like to say by way of opening remarks? Uh, thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Uh, three brief comments, really, by way of uh, introduction. Uh, the Freedom of Information Act, when it was brought in, uh, in many ways was not a big surprise uh, in the context of councils because councils have been historically uh, a very open part of the public sector, council meetings, are open to the public, anyone can come in, listen to the discussion, see what's being decided, see the context of the debate. Papers are available in local libraries, available on council websites. So access to information uh, strengthened, in fact, further by the ability of the public to both fill meetings, but also to see any item of expenditure over 500 pounds itemized on council websites has been hugely helpful. The challenge, I guess, is that the cost of the Freedom of Information Act, uh, whilst globally not a big figure, can mean quite a lot in the context of some councils. So the example of Broadland, which uh, you've seen Broadland in Norfolk, which is in the, the submission, uh, an entire market town's council tax revenue for the year spent handling FOI requests. And clearly you could fill quite a lot of potholes with that. So the challenge, I guess, is that what is in global terms a, a good thing can be rather a blunt instrument in the context of one individual relatively small organization. And then I think finally, from a personal perspective as a councillor, it has sometimes created a, a bureaucracy around what used to be a fairly straightforward discussion with a member of the public. So when somebody sends me an email with a question and finishes that email saying, I'd like you to treat this as an FOI, I'm in a situation of saying, well, I could just tell you the answer to that question. I do know, and I could tell you now. But because you've said it's an FOI, I can't tell you the answer to the question. I need to send it to the FOI officer who has to log it because we're required to do that to comply with the Act. And then we have to consider whether, as a corporate body, we maintain a register containing the information which you've asked for. And the response to an extent is, if you'd like to withdraw your FOI request, I can just tell you now. But if you wish to do an FOI request, you probably need to wait a month 
at which point you get an email from an officer telling you that we don't maintain a register of that information. I don't think that is hugely helpful for those sort of light, light touch uh, interactions that can take place between local elected representatives and the residents that we see. Yeah, go back to the person and have the conversation you've just mentioned. Uh, I, I would, however, once FOI has been mentioned, it feels like a, a genie is out of a particular box, and that, that creates risks. How would it be a breach of the Act if you simply provided the information? So the, the situation with the, the Freedom of Information Act as it operates in the context of a local authority is that it has to be dealt with, it has to be logged, it has to be processed in accordance with the requirements. So the question is, does the organisation as a, as a corporate body, if you like, hold the information which has been requested under the Freedom of Information Act? And the answer may be yes or no. Uh, in many cases, we simply don't maintain in an official capacity uh, registers of all sorts of information. So a good example would be um, expenses claims for councillors for hospitality. So all of that information is published on council websites, so you can read it. But sometimes people will come back and say, well, are you perhaps getting hospitality by taking one of your officials with you and getting them to pay? Now, if the council as a body does not maintain a register of that information, which it quite likely doesn't, because the answer in almost every single case will be no, and the answer in the financial cost will be nil, pretty much always. Um, nonetheless, we're not able to say the answer is nil. We have to say the answer in the terms of the Freedom of Information Act is that we do not maintain a, a log of that information. And in that, that it simply is sometimes unhelpful for dealing with, with the residents who I think quite legitimately may be asking those questions. Good morning, Councillor. Good morning. When, when, you, um, when you do reply, as you said you do, hmm. in the way that you've suggested that you do, in what proportion of those cases does the applicant or the correspondent, however you wish to describe him or her, say, um, fine, well, in that case, if you can give me the information without, uh, more speedily, hmm. without going through all the formalities required by the Act, hmm. um, please do so. Uh, it very much depends on who the, the questioner is, and this is where I think it can lead you down a, a real bureaucratic cul-de-sac, in that the purpose of the Act clearly is to cover uh, those kind of corporate sets of information, which can be hugely wide-ranging, which some organisations will maintain and some organisations don't. So if it is uh, one of my constituents who's asking a question about how much we spend on software licences, for example, as was the case recently, generally you know, I have a, a relationship with them, and they're reasonably satisfied with my ability to answer that question. If, on the other hand, it's a commercial organisation that wants an official answer, then they may well say, no, sorry, I'm not willing to take you at your word. I want the organisation to produce the official answer, and the official answer may be we don't hold that information. And, and that is one of the challenges with the Act. It creates these various different um, bureaucratic walls. I Although your response before. would be an official answer, you would be speaking on behalf of the authority, so it would be an official answer. But not within the terms of the Freedom of Information Act. Well, as, uh, I'm not sure of that, mm. whether the Act does require mm. that, but um, mm. that's, that's very helpful. Um, you, you also very helpfully in your evidence um, submitted a number of detailed proposals mm. for uh, amendment of the Act. Um, and I'm, I, I'm not going to go through them all with you, but uh, hopefully um, those details will make my questioning shorter than it otherwise um, would have been. Are you able to give me, can I ask you a general question to begin with? Are you able to give us any s sort of general description of the kind of information that your members want to protect using Section 36? Yes, um, I'm, I'm very conscious we have um, experienced ministers, those from the top levels of government, uh, on the panel today, and those will therefore have the experience of the discussions with officials when you are looking to, to think the unthinkable. And as we're going through a process at the moment of very difficult financial challenges, clearly in town halls and civic centres up and down the land, councillors like me are asking officials to prepare uh, responses to the current financial situation, which will affect people's jobs, will affect important services. In many cases, uh, it is clear that once those proposals um, fall under the sight of a politician, the answer will be, we are simply not going to do that. And we would never have considered it, but it is nonetheless something which remains an option. So I think the, the challenge both for officials and for politicians is to maintain in the way that already exists in central government uh, and was referred to, I think, by Lord McNally in his previous um, evidence, the, the safe space in which to have the conversation about what options are 
what options would be acceptable and what would not. And I think the big risk at the moment, and you see this in many different walks of life, is that you can create a, an attitude of mind that you might describe as defensive governance. So the question in the mind of that official, or indeed that politician, is not how do I get the very best, most open, most transparent piece of advice, it's how do I ensure if I had to defend this in public that I have a piece of paper that suggests that I'm not responsible for the thing that's now gone wrong. And I don't think that is helpful. So I think the availability of a safe space in which politicians and officials can debate and discuss, can make decisions and can then be held accountable for those decisions once they've been made in the public domain is absolutely right. And it might be the Act creates that in central government, but it somewhat limits its applicability in respect of local authorities where similar types of discussions are going on. Oscar, what is the experience of those cases when they are challenged and when you seek to withhold the information on, on the grounds of a safe space, etc.? Well, in the case of a local authority, it, it really is not the case that there is such a thing as a safe space. And, and the vast majority of what goes to a local authority's cabinet or executive um, will already be in the public domain. So with the exception of things that are commercially confidential, that will be the case. But a good example, and one which I think the ICO referred to, um, is the question of risk registers, which you know, clearly are something which would fall to be made available um, when they're requested. And clearly, for local authority in compiling risk registers, there is a need to take account of that wider local community and the responsibilities that we have as, for example, civil defence authorities. To give a really good practical example of that, uh, most hospital uh, radiology departments rely upon uh, radioisotopes to uh, undertake some of their work. They're also very commonly used in many different university departments and in some industries. And one of the risks with those is, of course, um, although they are not usable to create a nuclear weapon, they could be used uh, by those who are so inclined to make a conventional terrorist device uh, considerably more problematic. Now, it's very clear from the experience I've had of discussions with other organisations, Home Office, Police, etc., that they would not be terribly keen for uh, public documents listing the locations where all that material could be obtained by uh, undesirable organisations to be made publicly available. So that for me is an example of a significant risk, something which uh, needs to be very much on my radar as a, a local councillor, knowing that this may be something that my community and people that my organisation employs will have to deal with, but which in that discussion with those other organisations is unlikely to find its way into a risk register. Whereas the creation of a safe space where that can be logged so that should an incident occur, it is clear from government's point of view, it's clear from those who are trying to deal with what happened and the response, what happened, how it was planned and how it was dealt with, would be helpful. But publishing that information would in the short term, I think, be regarded, particularly by those other organisations with a very legitimate point of view, as not in public interest. But you, would you not think the Act, as it's currently drafted, provides you with the protection you need in that particular circumstance? I think it is clear from the responses from councils up and down the country is they feel no, it does not. That although um, in, the, in the vast majority of cases, um, certainly around half of the requests that come in are for commercial or journalistic purposes, um, the remainder being for members of the public and other organisations. But it does, you know, to me, lead to a lack of clarity where a safe space, it would be abundantly clear that this was a context in which those discussions could take place and all parties knew that those conversations were taking place on a basis that was confidential. But, but to answer Lord Burns' question, that has not been tested. So um, you, you, you can't say that the Act as currently drafted wouldn't provide the protection that is needed in the particular circumstance you've identified. I think the, the lack of certainty has created such a, a lack of confidence in sharing information in some cases that things that, you know, in my view, should be written down and recorded but should be maintained as confidential for the time being in the public interest are simply not being so. And therefore, an exemption in the way that it applies to government creates the opportunity to have those conversations and once decisions have been made, politicians can then be held accountable for them. But it hasn't been tested? Th that particular example has not been tested, no. no. Okay. Um, in terms of the, um, the qualified person, um, requirement. Um, you express some doubts about the need for uh, that. Um, does it give any benefits? It would, any, would there be any disadvantage in removing it? What's your thinking about that? Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah. I mean, the submission which has been sent in talks about this in a bit more detail. I think the, 
the key concern, I guess, from a, a council's perspective is to make the process as simple and as straightforward as possible. Um, the information commissioner said in his submission and his evidence that the organization does not have the capacity to provide a lot of the support which perhaps would be uh, useful to organizations that are subject to the act. And so uh, if um, some changes to the, the situation with a qualified person will help that, then it would seem to be a, an appropriate way forward. But beyond that, I don't have a great deal to add to what's in our submission. Right. Now, many of your members, you say, have expressed concern about requests made by commercial bodies for financial mm -hmm. advantage. Yes. Um, in your evidence, you suggest that applicants should identify the public interest um, which is relevant um, to their request. Um, do you think that would be a, a, how would that work? And do you think it would be a sufficient um, protection against what you regard as unjustified um, requests made for commercial as opposed to public interests? I think this body has been very keen to have some practical suggestions about things that might be done to improve the operation of the Act. And that is one of the things that might help. So we know around a quarter of the FOI requests are from commercial organisations. And what they are invariably asking for is tailored versions of information that's already in the public domain. So the council website will contain the itemised list of expenditure, but they're asking for that itemised list of expenditure to be reformatted in a way that enables them to demonstrate that their product is cheaper or that they think they can make particular saving or that they're more competitive than another company or, or indeed to contribute to the creation of, of content. And having personal experience of this in the, the IT and software uh, area, you can see that that's, that's what it's designed for. I think the, the concern that councils have is when you, you calculate what that costs, and the example given uh, the round robin requests sent to 200 councils taking 15 hours each to process, taxpayers have picked up a bill of 75,000 pounds to deal with that request. That's just to deal with the request. And that is tabulating information that is already in the public domain into another format for a commercial organization. So I think the concern that we have is that it is hard to say that one business's commercial agenda constitutes a wider public interest and therefore it, there needs to be some form of filter. Same information that's just been reformatted. Yes, it, it is exactly the same information. I, mean, I think we all know context is all when it comes to information, but a very practical example with IT, um, councils all publish their expenditure over 500 pounds. So looking at that register, you could off your own initiative as a researcher for an IT company, identify what that council is spending on software licenses. However, many of those businesses say, well, rather than go through the council's website, I'm going to send an FOI request asking them to tabulate that information for me so I just get a nice, easy figure. And why, can't, why don't you say that the information is already available? Uh, because, again, the, I think the requirements of the Act is the provision, I'm just trying to remember the terminology, of the form acceptable to the applicant, which the local authority is required to comply with. So in that situation, if the applicant says, I don't want to read it in the form that's on the website, I want it put together in a table like this, then the applicant is able to ask for that. And have you tested, uh, again, has that been that, tested? That, that, that one has certainly been the subject of extensive testing. Uh, as far as I understand it, it is absolutely clear that the local I'm authority saying, is required I'm to. that when that has been tested, the word reasonably has not been implied into the question of format. So the, 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 reasonably the wording... Reasonably acceptable to the applicant. Uh, reasonably does not form part of the, the wording. And I, I don't have the full, full detail in front of me, but I know the phrase, th there's a whole series of provisions, but one of them is the right of the applicant to request the information in a format acceptable to them. And this is where a great deal of the, the noise in the system, I think, around commercially driven uh, requests arises. A, a bit of a confusion in what you've told us, because your last answers have criticized requests for information made where the information is already available. Yeah. That's one category. Information that is sought for commercial reasons is a separate category. They may overlap, mm. um, do, yeah. but suppose the information is not available already, albeit in a different form. Do you still regard it as objectionable that it should be sought for commercial reasons. After all, if uh, that information enables the service to be provided more economically or more effectively, 
Isn't that a public interest? So I, I don't think there is a contradiction. I think there are a number, of, a number of different categories of information, but I think addressing the specific question, what is clearly happening is a commercial organization is moving on to local taxpayers the cost of research in the pursuit of their commercial objectives. Now, we know no, but, but many well, of those that, cases... That's only the case if the information is already available. Yes. So the register, I mean, in terms of council's publication of information, uh, as I, I think I touched on at the beginning, councils are extremely transparent organizations. So that information is published. But what we are, are seeing is organizations that are saying, rather than use my organization's resources to put that into the form that suits my particular commercial purposes, I'm going to ask taxpayers to meet the cost of having that work done for me. What well, does that mean? I, I, I want to try and, 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 and get this absolutely clear. Does that, mean that, does that mean that you would not object to applications that are made for commercial reasons if the information is not otherwise available? Well, if the information is, is not held by the organization, well, then... Well, if it's not held by the organization, then... Then, then it then would then fall outside of the yeah, scope the act doesn't anyway. Apply. But if it is held by the organization, mm. but is not otherwise publicly available, mm. but is requested for commercial reasons, mm. do you regard that as objectionable? I, I think this is another one where context is all, because it leads into the discussion about redaction and the cost well, of that. Well, not necessarily. So that would be a different objection. If you're talking about redaction mm. and cost, that's a different objection. I'm trying mm. to pin down whether mm. your sole objection is that the information is needed for commercial reasons or you would not mm. object mm. in that category. That's yes. what I'm trying to get your view on. I think the, the issue of the information being used for commercial purposes is not, to me, in any sense a bad thing. What is concerning right, so is someone saying, I have that information yeah. freely available okay. to me. Well, we've established that. But no, thank I you want very you much. to pay to put it in a better format that's more commercial for my own purposes. And the same surely goes for round robins. I mean, you can't object in principle to round robins because no. they are a very effective way of comparing performance. And I don't think that there's any principle objection to any of the elements of the Act. It, okay. As I say, context is all. And one of the issues with round robins is whether you get the context that tells you the true picture of what that information is, is intended to tell you. Sorry. Can I just ask the LGA possibly to go back and write to us about the effects of Section 11 mm. of the Act in relation to the question, the, the answer you gave about giving information solely in the way the applicant requests? Mm. Because I must say it sounds to me, looking at Section 11 and the guidance mm. given by the Commissioner, as though you're a pretty soft touch and ought to okay. tighten up your act somewhat and let us know whether really what you've said is exaggerating the position. Okay. I, well, I'll, please. I'll be pleased please. to check that. I mean, Thank it certainly you. is, that is the strong view that is reflected in the research that's been done by member authorities. So. Well, that, that brings me to my next question, which is simply why don't local authorities use the power to refuse yeah. vexatious requests more frequently? Yeah. Uh, we do. Um, but I think the, the issue that's referred to as much as anything is, is not so much the vexatious individual request. It's the vexatious questioner who sends in a request saying how many members of staff do you have whose first name begins with A, how many members of staff do you have whose first name begins with B, uh, when challenged simply says, well, I'm entitled to ask this information under the Act. Um, I, I don't think in the grand scheme of things the cost of that is huge, but it is a cost that falls on taxpayers. Uh, and I think it is that issue of how you identify someone as a vexatious questioner as opposed to an individual question as vexatious, which is probably um, of most concern to councils. But how much use is made of it, uh, the vexatious requests exemption? Yeah, it, it will very much, I guess, depend upon what the question is and the extent to which the person is known to the individual freedom of information officer who's responsible for dealing with it. And I guess that will be true of any, any organisation. So there are some uh, requests of information which might be seen as either manifestly vexatious or extremely frivolous. And uh, lots of examples have been talked about. I think one of the most recent ones was a request to know how many exorcisms have been paid for by the local authority on public buildings uh, in, in recent times, which I'm sure is of great interest um, to people compiling you know, stories for side pages of newspapers. However, it's hard to argue that that was something which was worth spending a lot of taxpayers' money answering. I guess where they become more complicated um, questions is where you have uh, a small number, and it is a small number of people, um, who seek to use their freedoms under the Act to ask any question they can possibly think of, 
um, on the basis that they feel the local authority has to answer it. And the individual request may of itself not amount to much in terms of answering, but if there are 10, 20, 30 of them coming in from the same individual every week, the cumulative workload of that mm -hmm. for a particular public body may be quite substantial. But would, would the vexatious request exemption be used in that situation? Well, the vexatious request exception, as I understand it, refers to the individual request and not to the questioner. So the authority would not be entitled to refuse the request on the basis that the person had submitted many hundreds of like requests for no obvious purpose in recent times. Where has that been tested? Uh, that's a good question. I think we could write to you and let you know what the uh, positions for that. Well, finally, I'd like to ask you about a very interesting suggestion that you make in your evidence, um, which is that um, you, the, the Information Commissioner should engage in a dialogue with local authorities prior to his issuing a decision. Hmm. How, how do you think that would work in practice? How do you suggest that would work? Well, that is the practice that's already operated by um, Ofsted, um, Care Quality Commission, many other regulatory bodies in this context. And the advantage of it, it essentially is to avoid some of the misunderstandings uh, that have happened in the past. I think there has been an issue of capacity at the Information Commission, and I think they've acknowledged that they have that lack of capacity um, to, to engage as widely as they, they'd like to. And on those occasions where it is clear perhaps that uh, a judgment will have uh, consequences for the wider sector, for example, which should be prepared for, uh, or where a judgment seems to be somewhat at variance with what was previously expected, the opportunity to engage in a dialogue, and if necessary, if there are things that are still in dispute, correct those, would seem appropriate. And that's why when Ofsted gives a judgment, whether adverse or negative, or the CQC gives a judgment adverse or negative, they will say, this is what our judgment is going to be. There is an opportunity if you think there are errors of material fact, for example, where you can tell us that, and we have an opportunity to consider that before we make the public statement about what's happened. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, for your evidence. And, and I hope you've seen, I mean, we've been particularly interested hmm. in those specific cases that you have mentioned, which indeed, I, it's very helpful to have your evidence. I think the pushback uh, that we're putting is to what extent are councils and other public authorities actually using the exemptions and the uh, abilities which are within the, uh, the act in some of these cases. And that is what, if possible, we would like more evidence on. Yeah. If I were you, I'd be asking the same questions. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you very much for, uh, for your evidence, and thank you very much for coming to, uh, to see us. Uh, do you want to say anything by way of introductory comments? Uh, I would like to make a couple of points, if I, I may. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting us to contribute to, to this evidence session, first of all. Uh, but before moving on to those two points, can I make um, a more generic uh, observation that overall universities uh, who we represent are absolutely committed to um, the overall aims of the FOI legislation and openness and transparency. Uh, it's its application and its application to universities that we have uh, reservations about. And that uh, commitment to openness, I think, is very uh, evidenced by uh, the fact that uh, in the UK, universities are pretty much in the forefront globally uh, in terms of open access to research and research findings and working out ways in which that research can be shared in appropriate ways publicly, uh, certainly in comparison with many of our international competitors. Uh, and likewise, there's a massive amount of work going on just now in terms of uh, communicating relevant information to, to students and potential students. Uh, and uh, a point I'll come back to, uh, that whole process now is being very closely overseen by the um, Competition and Markets Authority as we've moved since the 2010 legislation into an environment where 
uh, universities are operating in a, in a market, in a very competitive market. And so as a consequence of that, uh, a lot of information is, is, is put into the public domain and that's entirely appropriate and universities are uh, totally understand why both that's necessary and desirable. Uh, but the two points that I wanted to make for the purposes of our evidence relate to uh, primarily the burden and bureaucracy that the Act uh, requires, um, but also um, the point I just touched on there, which is that the sector has changed so much uh, since 2010, and it therefore is now our case that the application of the FOI is, is, is no longer um, appropriate in its current form. Uh, but in terms of, uh, firstly, in terms of burden and bureaucracy, uh, the reality is that universities are extremely heavily regulated already in terms of the information that they have to disclose, um, uh, not just the information to students that they're required to uh, make available and, poten and potential students as well uh, in response to CMA requirements, but they have to disclose information to the Funding Council uh, in, in all the UK um, jurisdictions. Uh, to the Higher Education Statistics Agency, to the Quality Assurance Agency, to the various professional bodies, and et cetera, et cetera. There is a lot of regulation and a lot of disclosure that already takes place. And uh, research undertaken by JISC, which is the uh, Higher Education Sector Body responsible for digital services, and we put a link in our submissions, um, uh, shows the cost of um, FOI compliance uh, is increasing quite uh, substantially and the um, uh, government's own estimate, uh, possibly now marginally out of date, is that it costs us about £10 million a year to comply. Uh, and the FOI requests are increasing all the time um, from just three per institution per month in 2005 to 18 per month in 2014 and that evidence is provided in the link. But my second point, uh, which is perhaps a more fundamental one, which is uh, the extent to which the environment has changed uh, in England uh, since the um, higher education legislation was introduced in relation to tuition fees in, in uh, 2010 that came into force in 2012. And uh, that manifests itself in terms of a, a deregulated market for students. This is the vocabulary that's now applied uh, to universities, but also the introduction of um, alternate providers, non-traditional universities. Um, research by Biz uh, in 2013 suggested that there were um, over 670 uh, alternate providers uh, with about 160,000 students, and those are likely to be the minimum numbers. Uh, and anyway, it's now out of date. Uh, and as a consequence of that, in the recent uh, Biz Green Paper, um, there is a recommendation that this whole area be looked at. Um, I'm just concluding, but would you permit me just to read the paragraph in the Green Paper because it is so pertinent. Um, it talks uh, about public body requirements and the um, anomaly between the requirements on uh, so-called traditional universities that previously were directly funded by government uh, and alternative providers. <coughs> and it comments that um, the alternative providers are uh, not subject, subject to FOI. And in that context, it says um, there are a number of requirements placed on hefki funded providers, that's the traditional universities, which do not apply to alternate providers. Um, many derive from treating hefki funded providers as public bodies. This is despite the fact that the income of nearly all these providers no longer principally comes from direct grant and tuition fee income and is not treated as public funding. Alternate providers are not treated as public bodies. As a result, there is an uneven playing field in terms of costs and responsibilities. For example, the cost to providers of being within the scope of the Freedom of Information Act is estimated at around £10 million per year. In principle, we want to see all higher education providers subject to the same requirements. So it's flagging in the green paper itself that there is this anomaly now. Um, and uh, we would say that uh, this reflects the fact that at the time that the FOI legislation was introduced, we were talking about a very different sector uh, in England. Now we're operating in a highly competitive environment, a consumer market, which is now controlled very much by the CMA. We're in very close touch with them and with which and associated bodies. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that there is very little direct state funding, we are yet treated as a public authority. To conclude, uh, we believe that the way forward on the back of the Green Paper is to uh, 
see a full review of the operation of the Act to uh, higher education institutions to ensure that it, the application is appropriate, but also that there is a, a level playing field. Uh, there are a few technical adjustments meantime that we've set out in our, our, our paper, but uh, I won't go through them now. Um, you mentioned that there'd been a sevenfold increase in the number of FOI requests per institution between the start of the operation of the Act of 2005 and, and today. Uh, two questions. One, would you accept that that's an inevitable consequence of people just getting used to the Act? And secondly, what's, could you give a, an idea of the, briefly of the kind of range of requests uh, that come in, different categories? Yes, um, this is detailed in, in that JISC report uh, that I, I flagged, and they fall into um, three uh, broad categories. Um, well, uh, you could send it to it. If, stu if yeah, student, student issues and numbers is, is the largest, followed by HR and staff issues, uh, followed by uh, financial information. Sorry, this is what the requests relate to. Okay. So it's students, HR, restructuring tends to right. give rise to quite a few, and then thirdly, um, financial information. Uh, uh, we can submit that because Thank it's quite detailed and you. quite granular in terms of the evidence. Uh, you, you say in your evidence that, uh, and, and this is on the second page of your evidence, um, that the act should be changed, uh, or we should consider the change, so that in future, the information, I quote, the information commissioner should be able to express a view on the exercise of the public interest, interest discretion, but not to order it with the request as being able to seek judicial review of an institution's decision. Do you accept that if that were to be the case, uh, it would profoundly change uh, the operation and structure of the Act and fundamentally weaken it? Uh, if if, if, if I don't I think that was the intention behind this particular comment. I well, it's a proposal rather than a comment, isn't it? Um, let me just find it. It's the second page, the bottom. Of, oh, this relates to section 36. Yes. Yes, I think the point about the, the, the I, I accept that paragraph isn't particularly well drafted. What we are trying to get at there is uh, simply removal of the head of institution, that whole layer of internal review from the process. Oh, okay. So then it's a, a much more objective uh, test. So you're not proposing basically to go back to the John Major Code sort of legislation? No, that wasn't the intention of what right, we said there. Okay, well, that's useful clarification. Um, can we come on to this issue of the alternative providers and you, your claim that the quotes of the playing field is not level? Um, what, pro what proportion of full time equivalent courses are currently being delivered by? providers who are out with mm. the FOI Act? Mm. That data is not known. It's not simply that we don't know it. It is not known because there are all manner of providers now operating at various different levels. Uh, and like, like who? I think full... Oh, no, it would be more than that. I mean, I, I, I will... Um, of the ones that are known... I, it is a low base, and I will get back to you but on this, but I think it's roughly around 10, 15 percent. But let me t tell what, so wh which kind of institutions are we talking about? Could you name some, please? Um, they would largely be for profit, some of them international. Well, I understand that, but could um, you actually name some? Uh, Greenwich School of Finance and London Business School of, not London Business School, the London School of Business and Finance. There's various management schools, quite a lot of them business orientated. I, can I get, let you have that because I'm being a bit vague as to what their titles and are, you, but there's a lot of for profit providers now, some of them national, some of them international. You are confident that taken together, uh, these providers are providing around 10%. No, I'm total. not confident. I'll need to get back to you on that no, figure. Because it sounds to me like a, a rather significant overestimate. Um, even if we were to accept that there was a case for a, quote, level playing field between authorities which are still significantly funded by the public sector by one route or another, um, and these uh, commercial providers, uh, aren't there two routes uh, by which you could do this? One is to um, exempt the universities and the public providers, for which I may say we've had no other evidence, and I, uh, I think there is um, 
no prospect of this happening, or uh, to look at whether these private institutions are standing in the shoes of public institutions and that they should be covered by the Act. Indeed, you could approach it either of those two ways. And have you given any consideration to the latter? Uh, I think our primary point is that there should be a level playing field. We would be more, as I say, I mean, there's not a desire to lack transparency, so I think we would do that anyway. What we're proposing is that there should be a review as to the application of the Act that accommodates the different environments and which takes into account the circumstances of both alternative providers and former traditional providers. Okay. Let's assume that the, act, the, 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 provision stay, the playing field stays uneven, that the regime for public authorities, including universities and FE colleges and, and the rest, remains within the Act and these com entirely commercial providers are out with the Act. How does that harm the position of public sector FHG institutions? What's the damage done? The damage is that it, it's an extremely competitive environment no, for students that, now what's, what's and that they are subject to um, bureaucratic requirements that other um, players in that market are not. So it's simply by virtue of having an un unequal playing field well, in a competitive no, I'm, environment. I'm trying to get beyond the cliche here. Well, today. it's the cost. Well, it's the cost, the cost, cost and the burden and the fact they're having to disclose information about their operations that um, others do not have. Well, but, but, I mean, the cost is, is altogether for all, you, you say, is 10 million a year, which is only 144 pounds, 93 pence an inquiry, which is not backbreaking, I suggest. Um, but in terms of the disclosure of information, um, what ki kind of information is a public sector university being required to disclose which is damaging its competitive institutions? So let's take London School of Economics, um, uh, Oxford University, um, uh, University of Central Lancashire. How is their competitive position being damaged by a disclosure of information, even though it may not be required to be disclosed by a competitor? Well, let me give an example of That's what I'm seeking. Um, evidence that I, I gave last year to um, a tribunal, the tribunal, um, which related to the disclosure of uh, academic salaries. Um, the case uh, w w related to uh, primarily disclosure of non-academic salaries but a senior level uh, and the uh, reason that that was resisted by the university was that it, it felt that these were very competitive roles um, where uh, it was difficult to recruit these members of staff operating in a, a, a very competitive global context. For example, fund, heads, of, heads of fundraising is a good example where it's extremely competitive to get these people. Um, and there was a requirement to disclose that data about their salaries. Uh, it, it was felt that it was damaging to have to reveal the salaries because it would put people off from coming to the UK to apply for these jobs. Uh, and there was quite a lot of evidence as to the uh, impact that it would have. Uh, it, it, this is just taking staffing. I mean, if you have to disclose all the uh, lots of issues around restructuring, it, it perhaps uh, constrains the operation of the institution in a way that simply wouldn't necessarily be the case for... Uh, alternative providers who aren't, aren't subject, but none of that, nonetheless possibly recruit, but, but recruiting we, for the same just, members of the staff. Just, so we're, we're narrowing this down to fundraisers, which is a very specific task. I mean, would you accept what, what is my experience, um, certainly, that of all the large number of academics and people working for universities that I know, they are acutely aware, <laughs> acutely aware uh, of uh, the, the, not only obviously what they are paid, but what their comparators are paid, uh, particularly in American universities, if they've got an internationally tradable subject or skill. So how on a, so th they know this information. Um, how would keeping it from the public help the competitive position of, uh, say, uh, the faculty at Oxford, which is no who are notorious for paying less than, say, an Ivy League in the States, but where they trade on the fact that they are uh, they have other advantages. I mean, 
How does this make a difference? Well, a lot of that information isn't... Uh, for, for commercially sensitive roles where salaries are protected, uh, the institutions feel that they have an obligation not to disclose that salary, so it's not all in the public domain. But, I mean, we're talking about a small group of people. I mean, the majority yeah, okay. of salaries are okay. in the public okay. domain. Okay. I, I could okay. Sorry, sorry. Uh, can I just focus on a specific example, which may be helpful? Um, if I'm a parent and I have a child who wishes to take a legal practice course, that child can either do it at, say, the BPP Law School, which is completely private, or, I think, the University of the West of England, which is a public university. Isn't it an advantage for the University of the West of England, if it be a real example, that I, as a parent, know that that university is subject to freedom of information, therefore I can find out more about the mm. university to which mm. I may yeah. have to pay substantial fees to my child to go. Yeah. You know, there are two sides to this, aren't there? I think that's a very good question, and that's absolutely the sort of circumstance where we would want to make sure that that information was publicly available. So I, that's why I started by saying there's no issue about that. We're engaging very closely with students groups, with the CMA, with others, to find out what information is of most use and there's absolutely no appetite to keep that information away from students and, and uh, their parents and potential students. I mean, I think that's, that's the sort of example where, come what may, we would want to make sure that information is in the public domain. That, forgive me for interrupting you. The corollary to that is it's really up to private providers whether they wish to put that information out to the public or not. Mm. Um, if they don't, they may be suffering a disadvantage. Yes, but you're choosing an example where we would not wish to uh, uh, not disclose that information. I mean, that's information where it's very obvious it should be in the public domain. We would want it to be in the public domain. The CMA would require it to be in the public domain, and I think because we're operating now in a competitive market, it makes every commercial sense to make sure it's out there. So that example uh, is one where we would want to continue making the appropriate information available. And indeed, there's a lot of uh, discussion and resource going into thinking through how the information could be made most pertinent, most relevant, and most accessible. So, so I don't think there's any dispute about that. It's that's other areas. And that's what I wanted to follow up on. I mean, you say that quite a lot of these requests are coming from students. Mm. I mean, what is it that, that you are not publishing that the students want to have access to? And, is, and what is it in terms of their requests that you regard as damaging to the operation of the university? Uh, I, I think that's the area where there is less dispute that the information should be in the public domain. Having said that, I know there is um, quite a lot of applications relate to admissions decisions and mm -hmm. areas like that where there may be sensitivities and, and legitimate reasons why it's not appropriate to disclose mm. no. why someone hasn't um, got in against someone else, for example. For example. Um, but I think that's on the margins. I think generally that information should be out there and that's not an area where we're really concerned. To um, something else you said in your evidence, um, you say this, this is also on page two of the written evidence. You say um, uncertainty of the determination of the public interest test has very likely led to changes in practice in terms of the recording of decisions. For example, minutes will tend to record decisions only rather than discussion, and information that is in discussion papers is not reproduced in the minutes. Um, I don't quite follow that, because if you had uh, an agenda item um, and you've had discussion papers to contribute to consideration of this agenda item, then whether or not you put the discussion paper in the minutes, the discussion paper itself will be disclosable under FOI unless there is an appropriate exemption pleaded. So aren't you actually denying public and students information uh, that, they, that ought to be made available to them? Uh, it, it could well be. I think the general point in that uh, paragraph is that the um, Act potentially has a distorting impact on the way that decisions are recorded, and I don't think we're making quite the, the more sophisticated response that well, you're... I'm, I'm going yeah. from what it says yeah. um, rather than guessing. Yes. Uh, I, I think the point isn't is that... A bit of a, I mean, it, isn't it somewhat of an own goal in terms of the efficient running of an institution that you should not be recording 
correctly the decisions that have been taken and the reasons why those decisions oh, have I been don't taken think there's any because people in the future that. will want yes. to go back yes. and, yes. and examine those yes. decisions. No, I think that's absolutely right. I don't think there's any suggestion that the decisions are not being accurately recorded. I think it's oh, more but the reasons for them and, yes, and the, the background analysis which it, has gone uh, into Of course, it. of course. I think it's more gener generic comments about the dampening effect of, of, of some of the legislation. It's not a particularly significant mm -hmm. point. It's a fairly self-evident point, but Thank you. Good morning, Mr. McNaughton. Thank you very much for, for coming. Um, is there any, do you wish to make an opening statement? Um, just very briefly, really, to set the scene to HSE's attendance to give evidence today, because um, perhaps not known by many people who don't read the statistics uh, in relation to FOI requests, HSE receives more requests than any of the other 41 um, public bodies who are reported on. And the simple reason for that is that 80% of those requests relate to information requested mainly, if not exclusively, by parties to civil litigation for information relating to HSE's investigations in relation to work-related injuries and deaths. Um, those investigations can vary between a very brief investigation that takes very little time and produces very little information or documents to a very major investigation. And because of issues of data protection, because of issues of sensitivity, because of issues potentially of confidentiality, every request has to be carefully assessed to decide whether there are competing interests in terms of disclosure. And of course, disclosure in any event is only actually wanted for the purposes of those civil proceedings rather than to be put into the public domain. And it's the burden, therefore, of that process that perhaps rather individually perhaps affects the health and safety executive uh, that is of concern in relation to the operation of the uh, FOI Act. Um, we estimate that we, uh, the resources required to do that on the MOJ survey uh, indicates a cost of about a million a year in reality, the cost is probably larger than that because it doesn't take account of other accommodation and IT costs. So quite a significant amount of HSE's resource is put into dealing with requests which essentially meet a private interest in bringing civil litigation or defending a claim. We recognize, of course, that it is important and the public interest in itself that parties to litigation and indeed the court have available to it all the relevant information, uh, simply that it's a cost that perhaps shouldn't be borne by a public authority. Could, could I ask before I, uh, Lord Carlyle speaks, uh, do you publish automatically the, uh, all of the questions and all of the answers that you give in relation to the requests? So are they publicly available to everybody or do you simply give the answer to the person who has asked for it? In relation to these, we just, we, we, we just give it to the person concerned. Where the request is of wider interest, then we publish our responses. But this is a very singular request in relation to a singular investigation that is only of interest to the, um, the individual requester in reality. Okay, thank you. Um, no, before I ask you some questions, I should declare the somewhat historical interest of, of having appeared in countless personal injury cases mostly industrial accidents, on both sides, though generally not at the same time. <laughs> um, now, um, as a body which receives a significant number of FOI requests, I'd like you to give the Commission a sense of the sort of requests you receive, and in particular, and I think you've partly answered this already, I'd like you to tell us the extent of the crossover with, and I'm using my words carefully, disclosure, which occurs in civil cases, and also it would be helpful for us to know whether FOI requests interfere with investigations by the HSC or in the recording of investigations by the HSE. 
I might take those in reverse order, in fact, Please. because they don't affect the recording of the investigations. We obviously record all the product of our investigations. We have to. It's important for any wider purposes, but particularly for any criminal proceedings, that we have clear records of every aspect of the investigation. In relation to prejudice to the investigations, our general approach is that prior to the completion of an investigation and or any associated criminal proceedings, we will decline disclosure under FOI uh, using the exemption under Section 30. And we are successful and the Information Commissioner has supported that approach. That doesn't mean that we don't get requests during that period. And because our investigations can be somewhat lengthy, um, there can be a number of requests asking us again whether our investigation is yet complete. And sometimes, if an investigation is very long, there can be the issue of the claimant is approaching the time limit for bringing proceedings, which can bring, bring, bring an extra issue into play. Um, once proceedings have been concluded, then you're absolutely right. There is a, a, a crossover and a link with the disclosure regime in civil proceedings. Um, the, the rules do not allow a civil in civil proceedings do not allow for a third party application for disclosure prior to a claim being brought. And now, obviously, um, the civil courts are very keen for cases to be resolved as soon as possible and before any claim is brought. So we get a lot of cases where the request comes in before the claim has been brought. Sometimes we won't know the stage of the case. But in some cases, um, even where we provide disclosure, and what we do is we look at, um, for instance, witness statements. We will write to each witness to ask them whether they will consent to the disclosure of their witness statement for the purposes of these civil proceedings. Uh, we might not get a reply. We might get no consent. Those, that information would not be disclosed. And then subsequently, there may be a third party application for disclosure made through the civil courts, which we'll have to respond to separately. Well, leaving aside Section 30, which you appear to be satisfied with as giving you uh, an exemption for the period of an investigation that might lead to criminal proceedings, what really is the problem about um, FOI once that Section 30 exemption is inapplicable? Because you're going to have to provide the information to solicitors anyway at some point, aren't you? So doesn't the FOI process avoid substantial legal costs, enabling potential parties to know at an early stage information that may well save, for example, the legal aid agency or funders substantial sums in deciding whether cases are worth bringing? Well, it, it is the cost of the process. I accept absolutely that the parties have an interest in obtaining that information. Sometimes they may already have the information so sometimes, for instance, an employer and the solicitors acting for the insurance company will request all information which has been obtained during the course of our investigation. Most of that information will have been obtained from the employer themselves and they already have it. So they're looking to effectively ensure that they've, they've got everything. But it is the cost of the process in terms of um, dealing with whether uh, that there are issues in terms of uh, um, that, that issue in itself, for instance. So if an employer um, may take the view that when they have provided a copy of a risk assessment to HSE, they have provided it for the purposes of any criminal proceedings, not for the purposes of any future civil proceedings. Has anyone done a cost comparison or a cost benefit, benefit analysis as between the provision of information under FOI by the HSE and the cost of going through legal processes to obtain the same information, because there may be a suspicion that the FOI regime in sheer money terms is much cheaper, albeit you have to pay it. Well, probably the reverse, in fact, because if we receive an application uh, for disclosure before a civil court, unless there is any particularly sensitive information that we do not want to disclose, such as perhaps our analysis of the case, uh, we would not object to the order being made. 
So it is a very simple process, usually dealt with without a hearing. The problem for us is that the fact that there is such a process does not prevent any requester requesting that information separately and relying on the Freedom of Information yeah. Act. I understand what you're saying, but the answer you've given doesn't take into account the cost of the legal process in asking the HSE to make the disclosure, does it? Which may be charged out at 150, 250 pounds an hour legitimately by lawyers. But most of the requests we get under FOI are made by lawyers. Right, okay. Well, that's not surprising. Um, I've, I've declared my interest already. Um, what controls do you think are needed, if any, to um, reduce the burden? And in particular, do you feel that the controls should be targeted at particular types of requests? For example, commercial requests or requests routinely asked by solicitors who may be very experienced in dealing with um, personal injury cases and nothing but personal injury cases? Uh, there the clearly is a difficulty in terms of deciding to move away from the request to blind principle. But equally, um, our experience of the burden on HSE is that it is difficult to see the sort of wider public interest that is being served by the resource that we put into providing the information in these types of case. And I recognize, and having seen some of the evidence, there could be other cases and other public authorities who receive requests which are perhaps somewhat similar in terms of having more of a private motivation behind them than a, than a wider public interest. Um, pressure on this. I mean, do you have any proposals to make on this? Well, is it, is it by identifying particular kind of requesters? It, it, it could be done by identifying particular requesters, but I, I understand the difficulty with doing that. So the, the, the alternative um, solution could be in terms of cost. So, as I indicated in my opening remarks, HSC recognizes the need for the parties in these proceedings to have this information. It's the cost to HSE and therefore the public purse which is the issue. And at, mo at the moment, the appropriate limit, for instance, being set at 600 pounds and effectively 24 hours of work, most of our cases don't go that far, but they may not be significantly below that. So um, we very rarely can, if ever, can charge. And of course, the charging regime does not take into account the time of the people actually doing the work. It's just the, 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 the limited costs that are allowed under the regulations. Can I move on now to the exciting subject which you've given us evidence about of ICO decision notice FS5012134. You've provided significant evidence on this subject. How many of these... Um, issues arise per year and what is the actual cost of dealing with them? Issues in terms of... In, in uh, terms of um, decisions made uh, applying, I won't repeat it, that decision notice. What is the cost of that decision notice well, that, and that, its consequences per year? That, 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 that decision notice um, is essentially means that where the investigation has been concluded we take the view that a refusal to um, provide the information requested will not be supported by a decision of the Information Commissioner because he will take the view that the public interest is in transparency and that information being in the public domain. So um, of the, the 5,000 requests that we deal with, um, about 4,000 relate to civil proceedings. A number of those will be dealt with when the proceedings are still ongoing, but there will still be a significant number, probably in the region of, of half that figure, where we will have carried out a significant investigation, so about 2,000 a year, and we will consider that we have to deal with that under FOI, that we cannot decline the request, and we have to then balance these other issues in terms of personal data, confidentiality, and other issues to, to apply other exemptions which might apply to some or all of the data. I'm trying to tease out what is the net effect on the HSE of ICO's decision notice, FS, etc. 
Um, in cost terms. In cost terms. Well, if, if that decision was the other way and said all their information is not in the public interest to disclose it whenever the, uh, if, if the investigation has been con concluded, we would not disclose in 80% of the cases that we receive. So 40% right. of them, uh, 4,000 4, of them, we would be able to rely on that exemption. So there's a considerable cost yes. saving as a result. Yes. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you now about the use of the vexatious provisions in the legislation. I think we absolutely recognize that for an organization like the HSE, where many requests will relate to specific accidents, it must be quite difficult to say that they're vexatious. Um, but given that you are in receipt of so many requests, more than any other body that has been referred to, as you said in your introduction, how easy is it for you to use the vexatious provisions and are you reluctant to use them because of inherent difficulty? Um, we have used the provisions in other types of requests that we have received. Um, and well, we, we, interestingly, we dealt with, in a, in a case, with other government departments where a number of requests had been made to a number of departments and where the um, information commissioner supported the fact that a number of different requests a number of different departments could be aggregated to determine that the request was vexatious and that went on appeal and that was supported as well. But in this context, as, as you have highlighted, we do not consider that we could say that a request from an individual claimant or defendant requesting information about one of our investigations was vexatious unless the amount of work required um, was so significant um, in, the, in the recent upper tribunal case where the, the, the tribunal considered this, um, the, the, the public authority was talking about three weeks worth of time to deal with the request. Ours generally aren't that excessive, but they are, um, you know, several days of work sometimes to deal with. How do you deal, we'll come back to the vexatious mm. provision in a moment if we may, but how do you deal with situations in which, yes, you have got a lot of information, the HSE almost always does because you carry out thorough investigations, but most of it's available somewhere else? Generally, most of it won't be available somewhere else because it will be information that we have gathered as part of our investigation and therefore hold. Um, some of it may be available in that the employer will have it, but it certainly won't be publicly available, very little of it. Returning, therefore, to the vexatious issue, vexatiousness issue, is it the view of the HSE that vexatiousness sets too high a standard and that you would prefer to have a test which is based on something more like reasonableness or proportionality? Certainly, the guidance, has, as I think was alluded to earlier, has been amended more recently, and that's helpful. I think it could go further in making it easier to reject requests on the basis of vexatiousness. I don't think, however, that it could ever go so far as to deal with the specific issue that we are dealing with, um, which is more to do with what is appropriate in terms of charging and fees for provision of the information. Can I turn to section 36 then, just for a moment? Um, presumably you rely on section 36 to pro protect information relating to internal deliberations which are inherent in what your executive does because you're making decisions, for example, as to whether to prosecute somebody mm -hmm. for quite serious offences. How effective is the Section 36 exemption and would you, as the HSE, like to make any changes to it? Well, we don't actually use Section 36 in those circumstances oh. because that deals with development of policy and so we don't think that would be covered in the deliberations that we have about decision making on enforcement action. We would then use section 30 right. where we would say that the public interest then goes in favor of protecting that information for the reasons that you've alluded to. But we very rarely, although we do have a policy function, um, we recommend 
regulations to the Minister, uh, Secretary of State, who then makes the regulations, but very rarely do we get requests or do they cause any difficulty where we are having to rely on Section 36. Sometimes you're faced with industrial diseases in particular that may have arisen in very large numbers in a particular industry. Mm. Pneumoconiosis is mm. an example, mm -hmm. obvious example, but there have been many others. Um, are you caused any particular difficulties by situations in which there are group actions or the equivalent of group actions? I, I can't think of any and, and generally we have a very strong scientific base and we have a health and safety laboratory that does a lot of research into exactly the sort of issues and um, a lot of that information will be put into the t public domain in any event as part of, of scientific research uh, material. by way of concluding remarks or are you content that we've covered the no, I think you've kind of covered everything I wanted to raise thank you very thank much thank you very much it's been very helpful thank you I think we are going to adjourn now until 12:30 when we have the next um, witness